background, and I don't want to talk too much about it, but um, what I, what we're going to hopefully hear a little bit of interesting information about how he progressed from an engineering, what, you know, what he learned in engineering, to at the University of Washington, I'll go ahead and we'll, we'll say that, he'll talk more about that, but how he progressed to where he is now uh, uh, owning and operating a brewing company here in Boise, Idaho. So I'm really excited to, uh, to have Mike here. Um, and um, before we go ahead and turn over, I do have the, the sign-up sheet. I'll be passing it around, so make sure we do that. Uh, put your name on there, put your affiliation, if you would. Um, so at this point, just, uh, give, give, uh, give Mike your attention. Thanks, Mike. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm going to go through kind of some, a lot of the history of the brewery and, and how we got to where, where we are now. And I'm going to try to relate it back to some engineering stuff. Uh, but at the same time, if you guys have questions, feel free to ask. Uh, I could probably whip through these slides real fast, or I could talk for a few hours. And I'd like to share with you guys what you want to hear, but I have some topics to try to cover. Uh, just a quick, because I can kill in one. Is everyone here 21? Some? Not maybe. Some <laughs> <laughs> are 21 have never had a beer before. It's, I had my first beer on my 21st birthday. It's, that's how everyone does it. <laughs> As far as engineering, a wide variety of engineering, or is it mechanical, or kind of all over the place? Well, mostly mechanical. There might be a few others sprinkled in. Okay. Um, so I like to refer to you guys as real engineers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I am uh, imaginary engineer. We refer to ourselves in the industrial engineering department. So go ahead and use that to make fun of industrial engineers. Uh, most because, you know, the other engineers actually make stuff. We think about the stuff that makes stuff. So, it's uh, so kind of my background. Uh, I grew up here in Boise, well, went to Boise High, uh, and then went off to school at the University of Washington. Uh, so I'm wearing my, I thought about it this morning, saying I probably shouldn't wear this, but uh, I'm a big UW football fan, so I'm not going to not wear it. <laughs> so, and we're not playing this year, so, so you guys can go beat the Cougars next week. That'd be nice. Uh, so I went up to University of Washington, got an industrial engineering degree. I loved engineering. I still love engineering. It was, uh, I, in high school, it was kind of the path I was going down and, and really enjoyed it. And uh, When I was in school, I didn't really know. I was sitting there my junior, senior year. I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, started applying for jobs, and I actually got offered a job at Boeing the day that I finished college. Uh, so I took it. Um, that's what you're supposed to do after college, I think, is take a job and just start paying bills and all that fun stuff. So I started working at Boeing. Uh, and then quickly realized at least where I was at in Boeing wasn't really where I wanted to be. I was doing industrial engineering at uh, the flight test manufacturing, so I was doing a lot of scheduling and working with the machine shop there. Knew that wasn't my thing, so I applied and took a new job at Boeing working on the 737 final assembly line, which is a lot of fun. It's weird to say that I got really tired of seeing airplanes every day. but. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a very impressive place there. We're building one airplane a day. And I've talked to people that currently work there. Uh, they're doing like one and a half airplanes a day now or something ridiculous. Uh, but that was really, really fun. But at the same time, the big corporate Boeing job was not what I wanted to do. At the time in Seattle, a lot of good beer. Started like that. Started home brewing. And decided I want to be a brewer. Uh, which probably actually move slides. Not that they're really that relevant to pictures. But uh, if you're wondering, there's, I do have a mullet in that picture. <laughs> <laughs> if you're wondering, that I'm a Blackhawks fan. Uh, so during the playoffs, I always cut myself in the mullet. Uh, so then during all this working at Boeing and, and doing the engineering stuff, uh, I started home brewing, learning about brewing, and decided that's what I wanted to do. So after two and a half years, uh, I left Boeing. I uh, went to uh, brewing school in Chicago, a place called the Siebel Institute about a three-month course that I always, in a weird way, equate to being in elementary school. Um, not that you're a child, but the, you're in the same room with the same 30 people from 9 to 5, and we had breaks, like recess, and the only difference is we got to drink starting at noon. We couldn't drink until noon. That was the rule. They wouldn't, they wouldn't pour beer until noon. So I went through, and that was really a technical side of brewing. Not There's not a single hands-on portion of that. So me being an engineer, I, I wanted to know how things work. The, I, knew how, I knew the process of homebrewing, but I didn't really know what was going on. 
So going to Bruin School was me learning the technical side of things, all the, the science and that, um, which was great. After that, then I, I knew how, to, how beer made, was made, the science of it, but I had no idea how to actually do it, as far as like which valve we opened. And so I went to work at a brewery in Seattle called Schooner Exact, a small brewery there, and they, I showed up one day and asked if I could help, and they said yes, and then they let me come back the next day and the next day. And next thing you know, I was a 40 hour a week volunteer. <laughs> so, they really enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed it too because I knew in the end I wanted to start a brewery. After being there, I, I decided that I wanted to move back to Boise. Growing up here, I love this place, and I wanted to start a brewery. So, let's see, it was seven years ago, about now, when uh, I moved back to Boise to, to start Pay Up Brewing. From there, we started about a year and a half later. Um, we did a 15 barrel brewing system. I don't know if anyone's been to our old facility down in Garden City. We started there with just a few tanks and started brewing, started selling beer and kegs. And in the past five and a half years have uh, grown quite rapidly. And then uh, this is actually a picture of our new facility uh, down on River Street. It's a pretty close to here that uh, we opened beginning of June, uh, where we jumped to a much bigger production facility so we could brew more beer to sell here and in outer line states. So, uh, some other pictures. So it's kind of talking about moving back to Boise. Uh, that's where the name Payette came from. I grew up kayaking on the river and spending time up by Payette Lake, and, uh, two of my favorite places in this state. So that's where the name came from. As part of that, we started putting beer in cans to have a can here, you can go on the river, or the Pet River, not the Boise River, because that's illegal. <laughs> so that's some of the pictures of kind of what our, and we're all about the outdoors, and that's what our companies are based around. Uh, some pictures as far as this expansion we did. So we, we went from a 15 barrel brewing system in about 10,000 square feet to a 60 barrel brewing system, and I'll go into some of those details later, uh, in about 32,000 square feet. So. Just some pictures of, uh, if you go into our tap room and come and have a beer, uh, it actually used to be a swimming pool, which is on the left. And so we filled that in and turned it into a bar, even though people told us we should have kept the swimming pool. <laughs> if we were in like Arizona or something where it's hot all the time, maybe. Some exterior pictures of uh, the transformation. So it used to be the Bronco Elite Gymnastics Facility. So it was a repurposed gym. There's rack, old racquetball courts we use in the production area. There are now a walk-in cooler and fermentation space. Uh, the pool is obviously now at the bar. So it actually worked out really good for the pool. Um, and then here's a, a exterior picture of what it looks like right now. So try to relate some of that into, into engineering. So um, here's some shots of to the process. The top is what it used to look like. That was the gymnastics area in the middle and the sides were all racquetball courts. Uh, we ripped that out, opened up all the racquetball courts, and then ripped out all the floor, so there's floor drains and all that. And then the bottom here is a picture from the brew deck, the brewing system, that uh, you guys probably all understand a lot better than I do. I say I'm a brewer. I have, I have no idea how this thing works. We have four brewers that are way better than me at brewing, so I sit behind a computer all day, and they do the real work. They were talking to me the other day, and I was like, I actually have no idea how it's all run on a computer. And it's really cool, but I don't really understand it. Uh, another view of the brewing system. So it's a four vessel, 60 barrel brew house. And so a barrel is, I guess, maybe you've seen a keg before. I don't know. <laughs> so uh, a keg is actually a half a barrel. So two kegs is one barrel. So, like, one time, one of our batches is 120 kegs, is what this makes. So the process goes through each four, each one of those vessels that's in there. There's four. It goes through a mash mixer, lager ton, brew kettle, and whirlpool. That's all the process of brewing. Um, now on this, it's all automated. That's not a final picture because the computer and piping's not all there, but it's all done automatic or semi-automatically and through all the different valves and pumps down there. Um, at our facility down there, we have combination of 240 barrel fermenters, which we do four batches in one day to fill up one of those, and then we have some 60 barrels that are a little smaller. So I think the math on a 240 barrel tank is something like 80,000 
cans of beer. That's what's in one of those. So it's a, a good amount of beer. Some of the other equipment we have down there on the left, here's our canning line. Uh, it's a not very good picture, but it uh, shows the process of, uh, starts with the depalletizer where we, the empty cans, they're all manufactured in California, come in and get stacked there. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever heard this rumor. I heard it once that like Keystone Light cans are just dented Coors cans. Uh, that's not true. Uh, <laughs> the cans are printed before you get them, so it has nothing to do with the dents. That's just, they have to have a dent in it. So I don't actually know the difference between Keystone Light and Coors Light, but not the same thing. Uh, so they, the cans are all pre-printed. They come down through the canning line. You put a date code on them. They go through the filler where they're counter pressure filled. Uh, see, uh, the lid puts on, it seals it. So it's actually, the cans are have a big opening. The whole top is not on there. And we seal them on the line. It goes through, we have a, a fill tech machine, which is a, it's a gamma ray machine. It's a gamma ray through the can, and if it's full, it keeps going down the line. If it's not, it gets kicked off. Um, actually, here's a, I'll probably go back to that slide. But a few pictures of the, the canning process is the, um, right there, it's kind of blurry on the top because that's actually the seamer is seaming up the top of the can. So you see on the upper left how the can's wide open. A lid gets put on it, and then this chuck spins around really fast and, and seams it up. We also do some 12 backing, which is what that machine is doing. I'm going to run back into the... Another piece of equipment is, I think, the coolest piece of equipment we have. It's a centrifuge. Uh, it's a separator. So we don't filter our beer through any sort of plate and frame filter. Uh, we put it all through our centrifuge. So when the beer is done, the fermenter, we pump it through this machine uh, where it removes all the solids. So it goes through there, that, that cone part, it spins around about 7,000 RPMs, and it's about a 600 pound thing in there. So as the manufacturer said, if it gets off, um, if it's off just by a little bit, the thing would shoot across the river, uh, <laughs> through our building across the river. So uh, it's an amazing machine, but it's scary when he says that. <laughs> uh, kind of take it back a slide, um, who, so who designed your facility? I mean, there's a lot of heat transfer and fluid flow and mass. And Somebody had to sort that so out. kind of a combination between our equipment supplier and myself. Uh, so on my side, with my industrial engineering background, a lot of things like the layout, the flow, and the process itself, that's where I took my knowledge and designed that way. As far as the, the equipment, the, there's a team of engineers with the, our equipment supplier. It's called Newland Systems uh, out of Vancouver, Washington, or BC. So they have a team of electrical, mechanical, process engineers that design all of that. And, and we do have some, like we mentioned, heat transfer of, uh, so all that liquid when we're, when we're brewing beer is, it's boiling. So it's 200, well, not 212 in Boise, but essentially 212 degrees. And we have to cool it down to 68 degrees. So we have a heat exchanger in there that we have a cold water tank that pumps on one end and the hot to the other. Through that heat transfer, the wort is coming out of the fermenter at 68. That cold water, in our system is actually designed to pump into a separate tank with hot water. So then we use that on our next process, or on the next batch, because we always start with hot water in the brewing process. So that's one of the things that uh, the, the engineers at the equipment supplier designed all that to recapture that heat. That's our main, there's other places where we should probably recapture heat, but that's the main one that we do on every batch. So the centrifuge, that, that's really why you have a clear product. We, when we first started, we didn't filter our beer. We used time and temperature to clarify our beer. Or you can see a fermenter at a brewery, they all have a cone-shaped bottom. That design is so, you cool that tank down, all the solids are gonna, over time, fall to the bottom. And that cone will collect them, and you can actually pull the beer off the top. So we used to do it like that. Now we can speed up the process by doing this. And actually, we get more beer out in the end, and you get a clear product. So. I wouldn't say that it's perfect because sometimes you still get a beer that you pull out of the keg and it doesn't it looks kind of yeasty and weird. We try to avoid all those, but it does happen. Um, the can stuff. Uh, he's talked about electrical engineering stuff. The that's one of four control panels that we have on our system. So even if it's all on the computer, um, 
the amount of wiring and, and programming that goes into that is quite extensive. The good thing for us, because we don't have an in-house engineer or program or anything like that, is that both that centrifuge and our brewing system are connected to our internet, so we can call up our guys in British Columbia and say, hey, we're having this problem. They can remote log in and diagnose the problem and, and change any programming and help, help us troubleshoot that. No, and that's just a, a cool picture of our tanks getting put up. Uh, it's pretty impressive. That it doesn't maybe look that big, but it's about 22 feet tall and holds 180 barrels of water. As far as my background, using it in engineering, so going through this process from being a Boeing engineer to starting our the brewery at the beginning, uh, a lot of people told me I was crazy uh, for probably good reason. Uh, and other people would tell me, hey, you're wasting your engineering degree. And on day one, they were probably right, because a lot of the engineering probably weren't big enough. We we're still trying to figure out how to make the beer, let alone any of the engineering part. Over time, I found I used my engineering degree almost as much as I did, if not more, at, uh, at Boeing. Uh, some of the things that I did at Boeing that I still use is uh, you know, just clean manufacturing principles. I will say if any of my professors walked our current facility, they'd probably cringe. Uh, but a lot of that's because we're just getting going and we sometimes getting beer out the door is more important than making sure the process is perfect because that once it's right, it'll be great. But in the meantime, uh, and I mentioned plant layout, so setting up the flow of our facility. Our, our old place was kind of pieced together, kind of set up. When it was a box, I kind of said, hey, this is how I, if I was building the whole thing, I'd do it like this. Well, when you're starting a business, you can't. You don't really have the luxuries of saying, "I'm going to do it like this" because that can be expensive. So, our old place was very. The flow was horrible, and the materials and the actual product going. So, in this new place, we were able to start with a blank can and say, "How do we want this to work?" And then the other big thing is our supply chain. We have a lot of raw materials that go into brewing beer. We have our hops, barley, our cans all the packaging material, uh, the water from the city. Uh, so it'd be very complicated and it's non-stop uh, fun, I guess is the, what I tell myself. Uh, <laughs> it's not one thing, it's another. Uh, right now we're out of cans of multiple beers and well, it's in some ways at the mercy of the manufacturer because they, they get to make it when they're ready. If I say I did it last week. Um, one of the big things I'm dealing with right now is with wastewater. So brewing is a water intensive process. So let's skip this slide go to the next one. Uh, so more relevant. So right now our current problem with our, our water supply is we, right now we put everything down the drain. Uh, and the city charges us based on what we put down the drain. The good thing is that they haven't charged us this yet because we're, we're doing some monitoring, but uh, they also charge a, a hookup fee. Um, only governments can just charge you for hooking up to their system and then charging you to use it. Uh, it's, in my mind, I figure they build all that into the, the cost of using their system. But uh, So right now we're looking at some potential very large bills from the city. The city can, they can handle anything we put down the drain. Boise has got a really good sewer system, but at the same time, we're going to pay for what we put down there. So we're looking at it and just started working with a wastewater engineer here in town saying, look at what we're putting down the drain and is it better for us to pre-treat and do a lot of things beforehand or just pay the city? Because we could do nothing, pay the city and not have to deal with anything or we can try to do some things early on so we don't pay that money but then we'll be installing equipment. Uh, so right now our, our water uses about 7,000 gallons of water a day. Um, you hear brewing is not a very green industry. I know there's brewers that really promote that. It's uh, You can be better, but it's really not. We use about eight gallons of water for every gallon of beer we make. So there's a lot of it goes down the drain. Um, a lot of it's for cleaning, process water. Um, and with that, we have a lot of uh, TSS, which is total suspended solids. That and BOD, which is biochemical oxygen demand, those are the two things the city are looking at when it comes to sewer water. If we're just putting 
water down the drain, if we're just rinsing something, putting down the drain, that, that's really easy for the city. They're not going to charge as much. They charge us based on our usage and then more importantly our TSS and VOD. So we're looking at say, how do we keep solids out of it? In brewing, we use yeast. That's a, a big VOD consumer. That's, it's a living organism. Um, that really can affect the, the sewer system. Uh, there's grain, hops, proteins. There's a lot of organic matter that goes down the drain. And that's what really increases our, our, our sewer fees. Um, the other thing I think I had in the last slide is, is pH. Um, the city also wants that your the waste discharge be in a certain pH range. Well, most of the time it's in there. It's a lot of cleaning chemicals. We use uh, a lot of caustic cleaners, a lot of acid-based cleaners. So we have sometimes our, our discharge is really, really low pH, and sometimes it's really, really high. So, and the city wants it to be in the middle. You know, they want between five and nine on the pH. And, uh, that can be tough when some of our, our caustics get up into the 12 and the acids down to three. Uh, so these are things that we're looking at of uh, you know, how we're going to fix some things. first thing the city is requiring us to put in, and this will kind of base on what our, our fees are going to be, is we're putting in a monitoring station that's actually going to, at the point of discharge, check everything we're putting down the drain. So that'll put into a computer and the city will be able to look um, for good or bad. It's, <laughs> it's a good thing that they know, but then they, they'll probably realize oh, what we're all putting down there. But the good part is then we can start working on a solution. Um, some of those things is a pH leveling tank that what we might have to do if our pH swings are way too high is actually add our sewer discharge, pump all that into a big tank throughout the day. Because then we can, just by our process, maybe balance the stuff out where our, if we're doing a cleaning cycle that has the acid cleaner and then the caustic cleaner, we capture all that together, it might neutralize itself or at least be close. If we were fixing it, we can do an inline pH injection to, to adjust it as it's going. Well, we could be using way too much chemicals to do that. That's part of what the engineer is helping us with is, is it better to pay the money to put in a sump pump and a tank and monitor it every day and then discharge that once a day or is it better to just fix it as it's going through the problem or through the, the sewer. Um, you know, our, our thought right now is putting in the tank is going to be less expensive in the long run but more upfront whereas the pH adjustments coming right into the sewer it's a much easier fix but our chemicals that we'll be using will go through the roof because we hope we can balance that pH out. Um, another option when it comes to the, the TSS and BOD is, is with that pH tank, also either a separate one or the same one, um, a settling tank where a lot of those solids we could, and that's kind of a side stream down there at the bottom as well, is you let a lot of those solids settle off the bottom, discharge the water that doesn't have that in there, and then dispose of that elsewhere. Then you run into the problems where you're, what are you going to do with that? Um, you have all this liquid wet matter, organic matter, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to just take it somewhere ourselves? Is it, is it useful for someone? Um, you know, some of the side streams I mentioned, so that the centrifuge, the great thing about it is it allows us to, it's removing the solids and yeast from our beer right now. Right now we just remove it and it's dumped down the drain. So it, it's good for the beer but it doesn't help the sewer at all. But what we can do with that is also the other thing we're looking at is integrating that into our um, spent grain system. So all of our grains that we use eventually go to a farmer. So the hope is with our centrifuge, we can actually design something to pump that into the same thing as our as our grain. And actually, the, uh, the rancher that has all his pigs and cows, he says they, they like the yeast in there as well. So it's, it has benefit to him, but it's, we just have to figure out how to get it to him. Because right now, it just shoots out on the floor and goes down the drain. Um, but same, that's, that's where we're starting, and that's why we're working with this wastewater engineer, what else we could do. And, when I first sit down with him, he pretty much says you can do nothing or you can build your own wastewater treatment facility. So where, what makes sense? And there's actually a lot of breweries out there that essentially do that. Um, New Belgium Brewing in Fort Collins, they're so big and Fort Collins is a small enough town that New Belgium actually has a wastewater facility on site and they actually treat water from the city as well. They help the city out by bringing more in. So um, that's the extreme level. New Belgium is also hundred times bigger than we are. Uh, but, you know, over time they were able to, they started doing these things. Next thing you know, they had a full wastewater treatment facility. I believe Sierra Nevada also has one of those. Um, and at, at the time, we could just 
spend the money and let all the stuff go down the drain. Uh, at least in Boise, we have the luxury of that. There's a lot of cities that don't. Uh, I know Bend, for example, has a whole lot of breweries that make a whole lot of beer in a very bad sewer system where uh, the chutes doesn't actually have the wastewater treatment. They have some pretreatment, but most of their stuff is either time release where they have to dump it down at certain times of day, usually like four in the morning, or they actually truck a lot of their uh, wastewater out to, I think, Portland that has a sewer system to actually handle their stuff. Uh, another thing locally that uh, we may or may not know is the hop harvest, uh, hops. So Idaho is the number three hop growing state in the country, and according to them, we're about to be number two, the ones in Idaho. So uh, we're at some hop harvest right now, and part of it, these are some pictures from the hop facilities out in uh, the Wilder Parma area, uh, and they don't really do it justice, but there are machines out there, and if you ever get a chance to tour one of those facilities, it's pretty phenomenal. So this is the hop buying right there that this huge 20 long, foot long plant they're trying to get the cones off of. And it, their machine goes from right there where it's, they're hooking it onto this machine, and then it goes through this whole process, and then out kicks, it's just palletized like this, and everything else is the waste is pulled out. Um, I don't know how that all works, but just tell me if you guys can ever have the opportunity. It's an amazing process to see. I don't know. Someone came up with that stuff, and it's always blows me away. Um, it's very relevant because we always brew a fresh hop beer. The one time a year we can brew an all Idaho grown beer, and I know they're brewing it right now where they got some hops last night from Mount Wilder and they put it into the brewing process like this. We always enjoy doing that every year. So, kind of stole the slide from previous uh, presentation, but uh, some of it relating mostly the, the, the middle stuff, the things we're doing as far as a, as a company of where we're going and where we might need engineering help. Um, a lot of the packaging capabilities. So right now we have a packaging line, our canning line runs at about 30 cans a minute, uh, which sounds like a lot, but uh, for the amount of beer we're sending out the door, it's actually rather slow. It's running five days a week for two shifts a day, so it's, and it also is a wonderfully designed machine. Um, that engineer could probably use some schooling because it's actually a horrible <laughs> and it breaks probably weekly. Uh, so we do have a guy on staff that's our, our mechanic that uh, has to fix that thing once a week. So we'd like to get something that doesn't break as often. Um, so a lot of our, our future plans include a lot more automated packaging equipment and things like that. Uh, well, if you like barrel aged and sour beers, we'll work on doing some of that. So. That was kind of the, the covering what I was planning on talking about, but uh, I'm open to questions and have maybe some answers. Maybe you can make something up that's good. So I'm more than happy to hear what you guys are curious about, whether how I started the business to engineering stuff to Husky football or something. Uh, so. <laughs> so you said a lot of it is controlled and some of it is through the internet. Okay. So how, how secure is the process? Like, the company make sure that nothing gets changed? You know, um, you know we, we kind of are like, no one's going to worry about us because we're just a small little brewery in Idaho. Uh, so I wouldn't, I don't know if it's that secure. Uh, I'm not that tech savvy, as I was mentioned earlier. You know, I should be. I grew up with technology, but I can't figure out how to put my laptop up to a TV in our office. Uh, so it, it's not that secure, although. I, we just hope that no one's trying to just hack in and reprogram our entire brewing system. <laughs> so really, they could. I hope you guys aren't that at all. That smart. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, do you recapture the CO2 and the fermentation and, and use it, or is that we don't? I know it's possible, and I, I don't know. We looked at it once early on, and at the time it was not cost effective to do that. Uh, CO2 is our number one utility. When I talk about all our water, um, the amount of CO2 we use in the process is ridiculous. We have a tank outside of our um, facility that's a 14 ton CO2 tank. Uh, I don't know how often we actually fill that, but uh, we've only been to our place for about two and a half months. Uh, 
But at our old place, our big guy would come. We had about a ton worth of CO2 that you would fill twice a week. Um, so between, mostly that's for carbonated and packaging. Oxygen is horrible for beer. So we force carbonate our beer with CO2, and then when you package, you want everything to be a oxygen-free environment. So CO2 is very important. Um, it's also, as you mentioned, it's created during the fermentation process. So you go to a brewery and you see something bubbling and all the stuff coming out of a tank, that's CO2 being released. Uh, right now, it just releases onto our floor. I know we're, one of our projects was trying to find a way to get that at least outside, because CO2 is pass out really easily when it's exposed to a lot of CO2. So that's an employee health hazard, but then also if there's a way we could recapture that and use that down the process would be beneficial, but we haven't looked at the cost recently if it could make sense. Curious, um, now that you have your new facility up and running, how much of your process is done at the new building versus the old? Is there like a percentage or are you doing primarily all your manufacturing at the new building? Probably doing 90 to 95 percent in our new place. Um, the old place we still have our old brew house there, but a lot of the equipment we took out, or a lot of the tanks we brought to the new place. Uh, we're trying to use it as an R&D experimental. Um, we're still working on that because our brewers can they can brew 40 beers a week, and then we turn to our sales guys and say, "Hey, you guys got 40 beers to sell this week." And uh, so we're trying to figure out how much we should make over there and how much we can, but. It, it's at least allowing us to do some fun, creative stuff. Some brewers that have some great ideas in the last two years have said, no, you can't, because we were making as much beer as we could. We were selling everything we made, so it's kind of like we can't do it anymore. So that's where it is right now. What was that transition process like? Like, did you have to contract out brewing for a number of months while you were switching to your new facility? So part of the reason we kept the old one was to try to avoid any lag. We were brewing full up in the old place. Uh, the transition was, I had a great plan that went nowhere close to plan. Um, <laughs> so there was there was a time where we were shorting a lot of beer to a lot of our distributors, which was tough, but trying to transition over, we're still brewing full up. So our centrifuge and canning line were all at our old place. Then we started brewing at the new place, and then we had to find that time where finished everything at the old place, moved those two pieces of equipment over so we could send a fusion can, all the new stuff. So it, uh, it was a process. I probably tried to stock up as much beer as we could in between, but it, it worked a little bit, but not a lot. There's people over here still. Yeah. I was going to say, when you first decided that you wanted to leave Boeing and start your own brewing company, how did you get funding for it? Or like, how did you start off and then eventually grow to this, where you guys are at now? So, a, so me personally, when I left, I Boeing is a really great company. They pay you well, so I had saved a lot of money. So that funded me to go to school and live for a while that night. I substitute taught, um, which is a very thankless job. I have way more respect for teachers now than I ever did. Uh, substitute teaching is, yeah, kids are cool. <laughs> uh, as far as the fundraising, so I, I started, you built a business plan, which is probably the most and least important thing in starting a business. Uh, it, I, I read it recently, just more of a, a chuckle, but uh, the best thing about a business plan is it makes you think about every part of the process, and that includes sales and marketing and things that I didn't really care about. I was like, we'll make beer and it'll sell, and that's not really how things work. Um, so I had to go through the whole thing of, hey, this is how we're gonna brew it, this is how we're gonna sell it, market it, get our raw materials, so put together a business plan, and I, it took me about a year to finally get all the funding I needed from talking with uh, probably heard the friends, family, and fools. And uh, it started with friends and family and went from there. And, um, in some respects, I wish that the first person I talked to just wrote a check for the entire amount I was looking for. And, uh, but it didn't. I have about 34 investors, uh, mostly local. So I had to talk to a lot of people. But the best part is that it taught me a lot in that process. Um, I'm sure if I took my pitch to my 34th investor took back to the first one, he might have wrote a bigger check. Because um, I, every every person, every different background will have more questions and you start realizing more and more what you need to know. Because um, a lot of times I get a question during an investor pitch and just kind of look at it, I, I have no idea, I'm going to look, have to look it up and find out. That was kind of the, the process and it took a while. Um, well, obviously it was 2009 and 10 when investors weren't 
investing a lot of money. But, uh, How did you find investors? Did you have, were there people or companies that you had heard about that you wanted to approach, or is it just kind of like a shot in the dark? You just started. A lot of it started you know, started with my dad and my uncles and um, one of some friends I knew from growing up, or the friends' parents, and uh, I know I worked uh, came down to the. I don't know if it's still here. Is, uh, what's his name? Kevin. There's a small business development center now at Boise State. That was a great resource. Kevin? Kevin Lord. Kevin Lord. Yeah, so I remember meeting with him and yeah, he helped I me. Uh, <laughs> he helped me get some things going and then you know, you'd, it would go in, in spurts of uh, get a few, bunch of contacts, do stuff with them, and then then they would refer people or, or I'd have to kind of say, hey, you know anyone else? I'm kind of hitting the wall. There's definitely times where you kind of sit there and go, well, crap, I don't know what to do now. So I don't, I've talked to everyone I know, so if someone help me out here. Uh, I did meet with banks at the time. Was also, I wouldn't say they laughed at me, but they are like we're not lending money right now. Um, but that was also they were I think they were more in fear of closing because that's what the economy was like. Even then, if we were starting up today, it'd still be tough to sell to banks because when you have when you show no sales, banks really don't like. Even if you have, you're saying hey. I want to have two hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of stainless steel. It's you can, the bank or the oh, back my loan. They're kind of like, yeah, that's nice, but you need to show me some sales. Uh, then we start showing some sales. They actually change their like, rather quickly. Going, oh, okay, now I, you can maybe pay us back. <laughs> but in, in the process of, and then our new expansion was a lot of uh, big bank funding on that and some investor money. Yeah. So, have you come up with new varieties? It's a good question. Um, a lot of early on in the start with some stuff I had tried, it, but since then, especially now, we are, since our brewers have the freedom to try new things, and we also have our tap room, which is very important for us, uh, both at our old place and the new one, of, of trying something. It, early on, I always like we try to do a little five gallon homebrew batch to test out a recipe, and then, then I realized that because of the controls on a homebrew, I don't know if anyone's homebrewed before, but uh, if you know everything about brewing, homebrewed, if you don't have the technology, it's really hard to make consistent beer. A lot of homebrewers make some great beer, but making them consistent is tough. So we just started, uh, the first brewer I hired, he worked in Nicosia and Eugene for six years, so he had a lot of experience. We were doing some testing, and finally he's like, I know I'm not going to mess the beer up, but let me just make a batch. And he's like, it may not taste exactly right, but it's not going to be bad. Do it. Um, it's still terrifying just making a batch of beer and saying, hey, we're going to throw a few hundred dollars of ingredients in here and just hope it works. Uh, but that's a lot of us now on our small scales. Make it there and then put it into our tap room and, and get feedback from, from consumers because that's really the best way to find out. If, I know there's beers that we've made that I've disliked, and but people really like them, and then vice versa, where I'm like, this beer is awesome, and people are like, I don't want to drink this. so. And customer feedback is the best way to know how you're doing. So, as you are scaling up, were you like compromising the quality of your or did it get better? You know, like those kind of. Uh, I'd say the quality definitely goes up the, the more you scale, and it's it's always interesting. Is uh, with with craft beer and just craft artisanal stuff anyway. Is that when people sell out or grow, they worry about anything, but. All that stuff, but really the quality goes up. The, um, we've had a, like a full-time quality control manager for about a year now, and he opened our eyes to a lot of things that we were just doing. We didn't realize that we could do something better and make it better and more consistent, more shelf-stable beer. So the more technology you have, more access back to these pieces of equipment, the better your beer should get. Um, there are some big breweries that. Uh, their quality may change based on raw material or process choices, but uh, as far as, and I'll, I'll use Budweiser for example, Bud Light is probably the hardest beer to make. I mean, I know people hate Bud Light or whatever, or think it tastes like water or love it, and that beer is the most consistent beer. And it, any pro, if they made a mistake with Bud Light, you would notice. Because really, because there's such little flavor, <laughs> it's hard to uh, it, it, it really is. A, like they are some of the best brewers in the world because they make the hardest style of beer 
the same every single time. And they brew in 12 places around this country, and every one makes the same beer. And what they're able to do, whether you like the beer or not, is phenomenal. Um, you know, people say it's bad, it's more of it's just not your style. Uh, it's, people think I'm crazy when I say that, but I just need to do what they do. Um, I just may not prefer what they do. <laughs> Other than uh, cans, what's your biggest extreme from an in input standpoint? Uh, other than cans, uh, hops is a very difficult one. Uh, because it's an agriculture product, it, the crops vary year to year. And we contract out our hops, <coughs> but it's tough to know what we're going to want. Uh, and that the prices are going to be stable. The last few years the demand has been going up so much and I know the worry from hop growers right now is that it's another good hop year. Demand is not as high as they were expecting. So good for brewers, demand is probably going to come down. But at the same time I have I don't even know how many thousands of pounds contracted at certain prices. So you know hop that I could have contracted at fifteen dollars a pound, well next year it could be ten dollars a pound, but I'm already paying fifteen because I said I would. So that's a tough one. And at the same time I could we could find out there's a beer that we make something new and it takes off, and next thing you know, we don't have any hops for it. Uh, we've got to, we have to make some choices one way or the other. We have a, our fall seasonal slaughterhouse that comes out here soon. This is going to be the last year we're making it because we can't get the hops for it next year. Uh, which is one of those things. Hopefully, they come and we get some hops and then we can do it again, but as of right now, we can't plan on doing it. So that's uh, raw materials can be tough. Barley is not as bad. Uh, there's a Barley producers, it's something they can store better, and it's not as it's not as many varieties. So we also contract out our barley, but it's not as not as volatile as hops. Probably the tough one there. Yeah. Bottling. Yeah. Uh, so we do a little bit of bottling in 22 ounce bottles for our specialty beers. Uh, I won't say never bottle, uh, but. We might do some 22 ounce stuff. I don't think we'll ever do six packs of bottles. And besides canning being kind of our, our bread and butter of why we do put beer in cans so we can take it to where we want, um, it's actually a much more cost effective and better for the beer. A can and a lid is probably half the cost of a bottle from a, just a raw material standpoint. Um, and then as a as I mentioned, uh, oxygen is bad for beer. The other thing that's really bad for beer is light. Um, that actually made UV light reacts with the hops in beer, and I, that's actually what makes it skunky. Um, so a can has a better seal for oxygen, the way the lid is, and it has no light getting in, so it's better for the beer. Uh, so as far as bottles, it, bottles still have the, the perception of being a, a higher quality beer and, and vessel. The cans are just taken off as the, the technology is getting better. Uh, but now the tough part is getting cans. Uh, we, like, unlike a bottle, you can get you can get a blank bottle and throw a label on it. And do that. We have to get a truckload, which is 204,000 cans. If we want to make a beer and put it in the cans, we have to get at least 204,000 cans because uh, they pre-print all of them. And then if you're if you decide not to make beer again, you could be stuck with cans. And, Got to pay for them. So, uh, if, you, if you're continually using them, they're great, but it is it can be cost prohibitive to get into. Of course, versus a bottle, you just throw a label on, on a bottle, and the next day throw a different label on. So. Are you making new beers with the uh, Idaho 7 hops? Uh, we have not used the Idaho 7 hop. Uh, I know one of our brewers talked about trying to experiment with it, but uh, yeah, we, haven't, we haven't used that one. Here's pretty good hop. You talk about barley, but you, but you probably buy it pre malted or something. Is there a company yeah. that malts it and then you can buy it from them? Yeah, so the, um, we get our grain from uh, it's a company called Great Western Malting. Uh, their actual their malting facility, one of them is in Pocatello. So we actually get, we have, um, we call them silos, even though technically, from an agriculture background, they're hopper bottom holding bins, not a silo. Um, my grandpa told me that when I sent him a picture. Said, "Hey, look, we have a silo." And he's like, "It's not a silo." <laughs> <laughs> so we get truckloads at a time. So we have two at our current facility: one for our pale malt, one for our pilsner malt. So it comes pre-malted. 
they'll fill up the silo. Um, that's our base malt. All of our bag malt comes out of Vancouver, Washington. And all the specialty grains that we use, that's what gives some different flavors and colors um, to the beer. So the 80 to 100% of the malt in a beer is the base malt coming from the silos. The other is a combination of bag malts that make up the color and taste in the beer. So, um, Idaho is actually the number one barley producing state, which is pretty cool. There's at least three malt facilities in eastern Idaho, so it's big in that part of the state. Is there any equipment that can label the cans? You can. You can get blank cans and put labels on them. Um, the blank cans are a little harder to get. The can manufacturers don't like making them because they want you to buy a truckload instead of a few pallets. Uh, so they're part of it's them doing that. And um, we've done a few with labels, and they're they're fine. So as a long term thing, it ends up being more costly and. Done it, yeah, but I also like the look and feel of the printed can for this one. Because people that do a sleeved can, which is pretty cool, um, it also has kind of a weird feel to it to me. But uh, that's another option for one offs. I know some of the breweries are starting to have like a slightly different style of cider. We've talked about it, and so one of the things when you have Cider is technically wine, as far as the state and federal government are concerned. Um, to be beer, you have to use 51% barley. Uh, so we would actually have to be licensed as a winery to make cider. That's why some of, for example, like um, Red's Apple Ale is actually only, it's not technically gluten free, if you're worried about that. Because it has 51% barley. But the true ciders, you have to be a winery, so we'd have to go through that licensing process. And the other worry versus beer, you're not quite as concerned. Pasteurization would be good. Um, we don't pasteurize anything. Cider, there's a lot more concerns. Uh, so most ciders, they try to pasteurize, with, which is a whole other set of equipment and stuff. Especially when, with anything, the further we ship from Boise, the more we have to worry about shelf life. If it's in Boise, you know, it could be consumed within a month of being made. When we send beer to Seattle, it could be a month by the time it gets to Seattle between all the dis distribution and shipping. So, so with cider, it, it would be cool, but it takes a lot more stuff. Have you thought about doing gluten-free beer at all? We have thought about it. We haven't done it. Um, one thing is I've had, I haven't had a true gluten-free beer that makes any good. <laughs> there, there's some good gluten removed ones where they use an enzyme to remove gluten. I don't know how it works, but it's crazy. And those are actually pretty good. Um, I think Stone and Wigmer won't make a few that are pretty good. But uh, to really make a gluten free product, you have to kind of have, and our old facility could do it, but have an isolated uh, facility where we couldn't even use, you can use rice or sorghum or, or some different things like that. Uh, but like our grain mill, we'd have to fully clean that whole thing out and before we could actually make gluten-free products that it touches anything that had barley or wheat in it, it'll technically not be gluten-free. Um, same thing with the yeast, we have to totally isolate that. If we use a yeast from one of our normal ales and use that for gluten-free, it technically wouldn't be gluten-free. So, could be fun, but never mind. <laughs> we'll see. Do the sour bills and beers uh, pose a problem from the same standpoint as far as like uh, Yes, that's one of the reasons we haven't done one ever is our QC manager who loves sour beers and won't let us do it. Uh, whatever he says usually goes because uh, the last thing we want to do is dump that beer down the drain. Uh, so sour beers, depending on how you're doing it, there's a lot of it's using use bacteria, which is also bad for beer, you're using lactobacillus or pedococcus. You put that in our normal beer in a rustler, it will make that beer bad. Uh, so now, since we have the two separate facilities, we're, we're thinking here this month, um, one of our brewers has some experience doing it, so he might try a little bit. Uh, we've been working on quarantine in an area. Uh, we may be overly cautious, but I'd rather be overly cautious than, than not. Uh, but yeah, it does pose a problem when you never know how bacteria can 
do weird things to beer, pinch the sour beers. If anyone's tried them or liked them, I know it's an acquired taste. I think they're delicious, but I almost put my name for the first one I ever had down the drain. I thought that was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> now that same beer I have, I really enjoy so. So you talked a little bit about how your industrial engineering degree sort of affected your career path. But you, you're in a, you're owning a business, you're operating a business. Did, did you have the any business uh, education at all in that, in that regard, or is that self-learned? A lot of it was self-learned. There's some, uh, so industrial engineering doesn't have some parallels in work. So I did take some business classes that actually counted my engineering degree. So there's some, uh, a lot of it been learned. Group of advisors that uh, help me with a lot of things that uh, and a lot of learning as I go. So, an MBA wouldn't be a, a prerequisite for, for doing what you do in school? Uh, no, I feel like I've earned, earned an MBA over the last five years. <laughs> <laughs> and I know, as you mentioned, the schooling, of whether it's engineering, engineering or MBA, um, the biggest thing I know that I take away from my engineering degree, whether the, the technical stuff is really that getting an engineering degree teaches you how to think and teaches you how to figure things out. This textbook stuff's great, I'm sure that there's a lot of applications, but real world is always a little different. But engineers are, you know, I've always found that I, I would assume all you guys are, a lot better problem solvers. You can know how to figure something out or go through that thought process to, to learn something. And as I've hired and fired people, I've People with the technical backgrounds, I'm always, even if it's not, they're not using their technical degree, I always think, it always seems like they're much better at, at problem solving and figuring things out, because that, you know, that's that engineering mindset. And, uh, where other, not, you know, there's nothing wrong with liberal arts, but it's just a different world, at least for me. <laughs> Anything else? Any other questions? Well, it looks like we're, uh, I, uh, we're out of questions right now, and, and we're probably out of time. So I do appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Mike.